Who was here last week when we introduced our Christmas series, our Christmas theme, Resounding Hope, Breaking the Silence? And uh, we talked about, if you weren't, we talked about the story of the angels interrupting the shepherds at night with a song, with a declaration that Jesus had been born, Emmanuel, God with us. And in this story, in this verse that we shared, we see three things happening. We see, first of all, the announcement that God has come, the presence of God in the form of a baby who would grow up to be a man, who would give his life for the sake of the world so that we could have salvation, no salvation, and be reconnected with God. We get threaded throughout this short scripture of the angel's announcement and singing, we get this picture of presence, people, and purpose. And of course, you know that those three things are the foundations of Day Spring Church. Everything we do, we center around these three, these three things. His presence, the presence of God. We value His presence. We value our time of worship together. But more than that, as part of our lives, is built in this core value of the presence of God over program, over principle, over structure, over religion. It's knowing the presence of God and His people and His purpose. This morning, we've asked three different people to speak into each of these things. Three of our young guys that, are, that we just see the anointing of God resting upon. We want to give them opportunity to be able to speak and communicate this message. So we've asked them to do so. His presence, His purpose, uh, His presence, His people, His purpose around the idea of Christmas and how those three things speak into the Christmas story. First up, Ben Green, who is our Connect Pastor, part of our young adults, part of our youth, one of our youth leaders as well. And um, Well, not anymore, but Ben's going to stare in, uh, around his presence. So you've already given him a hand, but why don't you give him another one as he shares the word this morning. Okay, so, uh, let me get my timer. All right, good morning, church. How are we all? That's good. So this morning, I have the privilege of starting us off talking about the presence of God. And uh, this morning, who knows that, as Aaron said, one of our core values is His presence. It's something we pursue. It's something we go after. It's what we uh, love the most about God. And, And so this morning, the kind of presence we're talking about is the kind of presence that shook a mountain. The presence we're talking about this morning is the kind of presence that caused King David to say that one day in the courts of the Lord would be better than a thousand anywhere else. The presence we're talking about this morning is the kind of presence that uh, the apostles were able to speak with great boldness and proclaim the gospel with great power. That's the presence we're talking about this morning. And the presence of God is not just a theory. I think so often in church it can become like just a theory, but it's not. The presence of God is not like the force from Star Wars. It's not impersonal, although I'm pretty excited for Star Wars coming out at the end of this week. My family's probably sick of me talking about it all the time. The presence of God is a person, the person Jesus Christ. It's God coming close to us. And that's the essence of Christmas, right? It's presence, it's incarnation, it's God coming close, it's Jesus becoming flesh, taking on humanity so that he could draw close, so that he would take our sin, take our, uh, all of our brokenness, and he's creating a new people from him, for himself, a new people who are called to be marked and filled by the presence of God. So we're not just here to exist by ourselves, we're here to be marked and filled by His presence. And you see, you can't just read God's Word uh, without skipping over presence. It's, like, it's not like a minor theme in the Scriptures. Presence saturates the Scriptures, it like leaks out everywhere. It's a major theme. So we know that the first two people on the planet, Adam and Eve, they were called to live in the intimacy of God's presence, right? They were called to live there, but we know that shame and sin caused them to hide from the one who offered them everything that they actually ever needed. Everything they ever needed was actually God himself. They didn't need anything else. They were designed for that. And so God's whole plan has always been to bring humanity back full circle to this Eden experience. See, the dwelling of God among people has always got been God's plan A. God never had a plan B. God always wanted to dwell among the people. He always wanted to be with these people, filling them, sustaining them, energizing them. And so the Bible is bookended with this idea. We, we start with Eden, and we read all the way through, and you get to Revelation, and it finishes with a renewed Eden. And so I just want us to listen to Revelation 21, verse 3. It says, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, 
and God himself will be with them and be their God. Did you know that we were actually made to experience infinite pleasure? We were actually made to experience infinite pleasure. That was God's design for us. But the issue as humans is, we actually settle for lesser pleasure than God actually intended for us. So that might look like money, a pursuit of money, and, and making money a key priority in our lives, or security. It might be relationships, or it might be even like our reputation and how people see us. But God's priority has always been for us to experience infinite pleasure. And see, the scriptures speak in numerous places about the pleasure of God's presence and actually that we were designed for it. And so in Psalm 73, it says, uh, this is David talking, he says, Whom have I in heaven but you? And the earth has nothing I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. And Psalm 42 says, As the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, my God. My soul thirsts for God. For the living God. Where can I go meet with God? And then in Exodus 33, we're probably quite familiar with this one. It's one of my favorite ones, especially the last part. It says, The Lord would speak to Moses face to face as one speaks to a friend. Then Moses would return to the camp, and this is the part I love, but his young aide Joshua, son of Nun, did not leave the tent. I'm like, I love that. He lingered there in God's presence because he knew that that's where he was meant to be. See, the scriptures tell us these stories and experiences and truths to actually lead us to experience them for ourselves. They're not just fun facts. The Bible there is recounting these stories to actually experience the God that lay behind all of these stories, to draw us to Him, to experience the God who actually drew near to us in the first place. John 17, 3 says, Now this is eternal life, that they know you, that the one, uh, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. See, eternal life is knowing God through experiential knowledge. It's not just head knowledge or intellectual knowledge, and sometimes that's needed. It's good to know bits and bits about the Bible, the history and all that kind of stuff, but ultimately the Bible is there to give us experiential knowledge of God. See, eternal life is knowing a person, Jesus Christ. It's experiencing His personality. It's experiencing His nature. It's experiencing His kindness, His goodness. It's experiencing who He is, like like Moses when he would talk to God. It was like a talking to a friend face to face. That's what we're invited into. That's what God wants for all of us. It's intimate. It's personal. But I know that the the daily practice of being with Jesus can sometimes feel like a bit of hard work uh, because it doesn't always feel like you're achieving something. I think that's the hardest part about it. And I'm just going to be a little bit vulnerable for a little bit. um, This is a journey God's sort of been taking me on for about the last four to five months. Um, it's interesting just this year how we've talked about um, life in rhythm and all this sort of stuff in in church because it's literally been my own journey with God as well. And so God keeps trying to, over the last four to five months, He keeps sort of wooing me and trying to draw me to Himself. And if I'm honest, there are so many times where I just keep making excuses why I shouldn't do it. Whether it's like, oh God, I've got this to do or that to do or I've got this on my mind or thinking about this. or And sometimes I believe the lie that even if I do spend time with you, God, is actually anything going to change in my life? Am I actually going to fall more, in, fall more in love with you? Or am I actually going to be transformed by this moment with you? And so it can be tough having those thoughts when you know that it's actually the best thing for you. See, when I went to America with Aaron and Braid recently, my one prayer going there was, was this. It was, God, give me the encounter that I need, not necessarily the one that I want. Because I was like... I might want a whole bunch of things. I'm like, God, I might want tears. I might want like some, when we're at Bethel, having some amazing holy awe moment of God during worship, or I might have had some awesome visionary experience. I'm like, they're all cool things. And I'm like, it's great when people have them, but I'm like, I just have no idea. And I'm like, God, just give me the encounter that I need, not necessarily the one that I want. But I just needed my mindset and my heart to shift to be able to spend time in his presence again. And so God did it in the most beautiful way of meeting meeting me exactly where I needed him. Uh, it wasn't dramatic, it wasn't what people would call profound, uh, but it literally just came through the speaker, Chris Cruz, who is the young adults pastor at Bethel, and he's le- recently released a book called The Practice of Being with Jesus, and that alone just sort of changed everything for me, because it literally spoke to the very core of everything that I'd been thinking about for the last four to five months, and just actually learning that just being with Jesus is what we're c- created for, just being with Him. And so he only spoke for 15 minutes or so, but it actually had a profound impact on me. And so since then, uh, with varying degrees of growth, obviously, I've had just 
those amazing times with God again, just spending time in his presence, just stopping and being still. And so as Christmas comes around again, uh, we get reminded of all these stories, don't we? We get reminded of Herod, of the escape to Egypt, of the Magi, of the star in the east, and undoubtedly, someone's going to talk about Emmanuel, which is God with us. See, the term Emmanuel captures the idea that God's presence, that presence is God's priority. Because at the root of Christmas is a giving God, the generosity of an almighty, all-powerful God, giving himself to a people so that we could once again be in his presence. That's the heart of it. And so Emmanuel is shown in one, uh, Matthew 1, verses 20 to 23. It says, uh, all this took, after saying a bunch of other things, it says, all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. So here we have, between the two bookends of Eden and new creation, presence once again. God becoming man in the person of Jesus Christ, drawing near to us, creator among the created, God with us. See, God entering a world filled with sin, filled with brokenness, and filled with people desperately needing him, but at the same time not realizing how desperately they needed him. And so in that one act of giving himself and taking on flesh and coming to earth as Emmanuel, God with us, He opened the way so that every day we can experience and encounter him as a friend. And so my encouragement this Christmas is this. Let's be thankful that Jesus has opened our eyes to the reality of who he is. Let's be thankful that Jesus has actually awakened faith in our hearts so that we can actually experience his presence every single day. That the the gates have been opened wide for us to step straight in. Where we get to prioritize his presence over principles or formulas or structures for the sake of knowing him. See, God's presence is priority. We are a people of his presence. And so this Christmas, how can we make time with our families or individually to stop, to rest, to receive from him, because that's what we were created for. To enjoy God as God and to know him and be known by him. Amen? Awesome. Very good. How good was that? His presence. Big part of who we are at Dayspring. Ben's communicated that so clearly, so well. Our next speaker is uh, Caitlin Neitz, who is our kids' pastor. (laughs) Extraordinaire. But what you may not realize is that she's also a very gifted communicator as well. And so why don't you again welcome Caitlin as she comes and preaches on his people. All right, I'm going to start my timer too. Good morning, how are we? Good? So like Aaron said, I get to speak into people this morning and I'm really excited because when you think of Christmas, of course you think of people, right? So much attention is given to the people in our lives this time of year. We celebrate, we gather with loved ones, we buy teacher presents, we we are involved in Secret Santa, it's People, people, people. But the tension is, sometimes people can actually mess with and ruin our perfect Christmas, right? Has anyone experienced a bit of tension with people during the Christmas season? Yes. It could be simple. It could be when you go to the shops. Adam is like, yes, owning that. The extrovert is owning that. When you go to the shops, you know what you want to buy. You want to get in and you want to get out, especially if you are shopping with Kristen. Let's get this done. But then you are stuck behind the person that is walking painfully slow, that they think they're just going for a casual Sunday stroll. Anyone experience that tension? Yes. Or it could be your own children. If you are a little OCD like me when it comes to decorating the Christmas tree, they decorate it all wrong. How many decorations can they fit on one branch? Does anybody else fix the Christmas tree once they're in bed? There's a few. I feel a bit lonely. I feel sorry for my children. But people can get in the way of our perfect Christmas. But the reality is, Christmas is actually all about people. We know the saying, Jesus is the reason for the season. And yes, he is. He is actually why we celebrate. And he is who we worship. But Jesus had, and still has a reason for the season, and that is people. That is humanity. The Father's heart for his sons and daughters is the whole reason why Jesus came. And as his people, those who allow his heart to permeate our own, his sons and daughters, they also become our reason. Amen? 
Just like our, Pastor Aaron spoke, I have to remember his family, but let's put pastor when we're at church. <laughs> pastor Aaron spoke last week on hope resounding and breaking the silence. We carry that sound of hope. We release that sound of freedom. And as his people, we are redemptive by nature because we have received the Redeemer. So this year, we don't just celebrate what we've received, but we receive and we release. We walk in and re- release redemption because it's our nature, because of who is within us. If you have your Bible, why don't you go ahead and turn to John chapter 8. John 8, and we're going to start at verse 1. But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Now early in the morning he came again into the temple, and all the people came to him, and he sat down and taught them. Then the scribes and Pharisees brought to him a woman caught in adultery, and when they had set her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. Now they said this to him, no, sorry, now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned, but what do you say? This they said, testing him, that they may have something of which to accuse him, but Jesus stooped down and wrote on the ground with his finger as though he did not hear. I love that. He doesn't even acknowledge the accusers, as though he did not hear. So when they continued asking him, he raised himself up and said to them, He who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. Then those who heard it, being convicted by their conscience, went out one by one, beginning with the oldest, even to the last. And Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus had raised himself up and saw that no one but the woman, he said to her, Woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. How Jesus responds to this woman is a perfect example of what it is to be redemptive by nature. Can we put ourselves in this woman's position for a moment? And I'm not suggesting that we've all committed adultery, but I'm sure we are all familiar with that sense of hopelessness, being stuck in our circumstance, whether it's from our choices or things out of our control, but feeling destined to be on this merry-go-round forever. Here is this woman caught in shame in the very act, how humiliating, and then her shame is paraded out in front of those who would want to point and accuse And what does Jesus do? He silences her accusers. And rather than adding further condemnation, he offers her hope. He gives her an exit. He doesn't give her a 10-step plan. This is what you have to do if you want me to forgive you. Or if you continue to do this, this is what's going to happen. He doesn't warn her. No, he releases her. I just imagine his kind eyes. He looks at her and he says, go, go and sin no more. That is redemption, and that is what we get to bring to the world. The words that he speaks, they're not empty. He's not getting mad at her. What is wrong with you? Get your act together. Just stop it. He's kind. His words are empowerment for her. And for those of us who have accepted Jesus as our Savior, we know this encounter well. We have been redeemed. We have been redeemed by our Savior. And because of what we have received... Now, redemption flows in us. That is our nature, and that is what we get to bring to this world this Christmas and every other day. And it changes how we see people. In our coming and going, every day, the people that we encounter, every single one of them, they are purposed to be living testimonies of the redemption of Jesus Christ. They are purposed to be living testimonies of the good news. And as his people, we allow his heart to change how we see them and how we respond to them. It doesn't matter whether or not they're living in that reality. We allow his heart to shape how we see them. Amen. And I understand that life is messy. People can make mistakes. People can repeat behaviors that are not okay. And wisdom is needed in those relationships. But there is a difference between putting a necessary boundary in place compared to locking someone in an inescapable prison. And that is exactly what these religious people did. They brought her out. They cast her judgments on her. There is nothing for you beyond this moment. There is nothing beyond this mistake. There is nothing beyond this reputation. This is now who you are. The line has been drawn in the sand, and here is our judgment. But Jesus, he does the opposite. He released her from shame and empowered her to go and sin no more. He brought freedom to the captive, just like it says in Isaiah 61. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives 
and the opening of the prison to those who were bound. This is kind of a trivial example, but when Elliot, our eldest, started prep back in Newcastle, she was in a class with some children that were from former teachers of ours and even a grandchild of a former teacher. And when I found this out, all of a sudden I felt pressure to prove myself, that I no longer was that teenager who skipped class or who misbehaved. Ben was no longer the emo kid. If you're a bit confused of what that means, imagine dark clothes, black hair with a big black fringe covering his face, which we like to call the mud flap. I had his permission to share that. I didn't throw him under the bus. But I felt pressure to prove that that is no longer us. We grew up at some point. We are successful adults, somewhat, somewhat successful parents. And here is my daughter as an example. She's clean, her teeth are brushed if we won that argument, and she's happy and she's loved. Look, we are not the same. People desire so strongly to be viewed for who they are. There is nothing more suffocating or debilitating than being stuck under our our old mistakes and not being able to get out from under them. And as these people, we get to release that. So many people are longing for that encounter that that woman had where they are given freedom and permission to actually stand up and walk out of their mistake, walk out of their reputation. And some people don't even know that they can hope for that. They live in such hopelessness that this is it that anyone that would look at me beyond my mistake is just not even an idea that would occur to them. But we get to bring it. We get to bring redemption. People who are redemptive by nature release freedom and hope by how they choose to see and how they choose to respond. It doesn't happen by default. It's a partnership with his spirit. People who are redemptive, they allow the redeemer to permeate their heart and make clear their vision to see people how God has created them to be. So wherever you find yourself this morning, maybe you are a master at this, and if you are, congratulations, we probably can't be friends because I'm still learning. But maybe if you struggle with this, maybe you've made mistakes, maybe you've made judgments. Breaking news, we are all in process, amen? No one has this perfected, only Jesus is perfect at that. That is why we need his presence. His people are only his people because he is within them. We cannot do this without his presence. And in those areas in relationships where maybe we have made mistakes, where this is on us, we own this, Jesus is right there in the middle of it with a way forward. Redemption isn't a one-hit wonder. It's a beautiful story told throughout the entirety of a surrendered life. Time and time again, his redemption is being told through us as we surrender afresh and allow his purpose to be fulfilled through us. So this season, yes, let's celebrate our reason, Jesus. Let's celebrate him and give all the glory. But let's also keep our eyes and our hearts open for his reason. Let's allow our Savior's redemptive nature to become our own. Amen? Amen. Beautiful. I'm starting to think that this was a mistake. That uh, you you as a church get to see how much you can actually say in 10 minutes. Wow. Don't get used to it. Next week, we're back to 40. (laughs) Our presence, his presence, his people, and of course, our last foundation ties it all together, his purpose. And uh, to preach on that this morning, we're going to invite Braidwood Rathbone to come on up and share. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) <laughs> Thanks, Aaron. Wow, man, that was a lot of information. I'm so blessed just by what, what was shared. Um, firstly, I'd just like to share, um, God has really been speaking to me a lot through dreams lately. And um, I, do we have Dan Heron and Dan Quirk here today? Can you stand up for us? And Lex, that would be great. But I don't think Quirk's here. He'll, he'll have to listen in. But I just had this dream last night, and I just really felt strongly to share it that uh, we were out on one of these trips that I do, and we had the stage folder out, and Day Spring Worship was leading worship, and Joel was there and everything. And then we had a time of ministry, and I stepped off the stage and started praying for people. And firstly, I came to you, Dan, and I, I put my hands on your shoulders, and the presence of God smashed you to the ground. And you started rolling and laughing and just soaking in the presence of God. And then I moved down the line, and I was praying for a, a lot more of our young adults, 
and I touched Dan Quirk and the same thing happened. And I woke up puzzled, just like, okay, that's just a dream, cool, thanks Lord. But um, he started speaking to me about it real clear and he said, you have a ministry on your life. He said, don't forget the ministry on your life. He said, I've called these two men to be ministers of my gospel. And no matter what, what season you're in, no matter what it looks like at the moment, there is that call on your life. And you too, Lex. And I just want you to know that because this morning he says, you're called to the ministry. And now I know everyone is called to the ministry. Everyone's called to be Jesus where they are. But some people are called out to this specific thing. And I feel that's for you. So be blessed in that this morning. Bless you guys. So I'm going to speak on the presence of God. And I always hold microphones like a, like a singer because that's how I've been taught. So sorry about that. But <laughs> if you could turn to Luke chapter 1, please, that would be awesome. So Ben beautifully unpacked the presence of God, the beautiful presence of God that we know in this house really well, a thing that we're well acquainted with, a person rather that we're well acquainted with. And uh, Caitlin has unpacked the people of God. Now I want to talk about the purpose of God. And the purpose of God is released and found when the presence of God rests on the people of God. So a few months ago, about three months ago, I woke up in the morning, much like this morning, (laughs) but with a burning, a broken, burning heart. And this was different. Man, I love telling the lost about Jesus. It's a big part of my calling. I love it so much. But this was different. I was stirred in a different way. I was really stirred for the lost, and I had a broken heart. And then all of a sudden, I saw this picture. This is early in the morning. I've woken up of of the famous atheist and the famous intellectual Christian sitting on a, 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 in a debate on a stage. Probably seen that in, on YouTube a few times. And the question was between them: Is there a God? Can we really know for sure? And they battled it out intellectually. And my heart broke and broke and broke as, as God downloaded his heart for these people. And so historically, what has been the answer to this question has quite often come in systematic religion. And we know in this house that that doesn't get us very far. Now, I'm not at all saying that church is the problem. Church is beautiful. Church is, is, is a commissioned thing by the Lord. But what I am talking about is religious systems. As Bill Johnson puts it, he says it's form without power. Man's wisdom disguised as God's will. And religion is a people, people's purpose built on principles and not on God's presence. Now, if that's what we offer to that question, we're in a little bit of trouble. And so my question today is, what really is the plan and the purpose of God? What was the original design? Why did he send Jesus? What was that all about? And so we're going to go to Luke 1 here. How long have I got? Thank you, Lord. So we're going to read this story. It's, it's absolutely beautiful. Honestly, I've, I've been sitting in it all week, and it's touching me more and more every time I read it. We're going to start from chapter 1, verse 30. So the angel has come to Mary. That's where we're up to. Then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son, and he shall be called Jesus, which means salvation or or deliverer, a rescuer. He will be great, and he will be called the son of the highest, the Lord And then the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob. And his kingdom, of this kingdom, there will be no end. Then Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I do not know a man? And the angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore also the Holy One who is born to you will be called the Son of God. Now we're just going to skip down to 38. This is Mary's response to this incredible news. Mary says, Behold the maidservant of the Lord. She's saying, I'm your servant, Lord. 
let it be according to your word. What an incredible response of this teenage girl. Most scholars believe she would have been between 13, 16 years old, maybe a little older. And her response to this amazing word is, yes, Lord. Her response to the presence of God coming and overshadowing her is, yes, Lord. I'm your servant. Let it be done according to your will. Beautiful. And so as the presence of God touches her, the purpose of God is conceived in her for all humanity. Now, this is a picture for us today. This is a prophetic picture for us today. We as the people of God, as the church of God, when we say yes to keeping the presence of God as number one, when we say yes to keeping His, His person, His presence in the center, we find the purpose of God and we are released into the purpose of God for our lives. And so I just want to skip over to um, John 17, 3, that Ben very nicely spoke on as well. So thank you, Holy Spirit, for that. <laughs> and this is honestly one of my favorite scriptures. My connect group knows I've been preaching at them all, all year. Um, we're just going to start 17, verse, verse 1, we'll start in. Father, the hour has come. Glorify your... This is Jesus, by the way. We've probably read this passage many times. Jesus speaking, speaking to the Father. Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son may glorify you. As you have given him authority over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus whom you have sent. Now this word know here is very interesting. In the Greek, Russell's going to do it way better than me. That's okay. Everyone always says that, don't they? But that's all right. Bless you, man. You're awesome. Ginosko. And it means, it's the same word we found in Luke chapter 1 where Mary says, I haven't known a man. I don't know a man. It's an intimate knowing, separate from the word that is pure knowledge. It's a different word here. It means intimate knowing, an intimate knowing, the most intimate knowing. In this Luke 1 passage, it's used as, as, as the thing between a man and a woman, the beautiful sacred moment between a, a, a husband and a wife that God has given. In the same way, Jesus says that they may know God in this way. And I propose this morning, this is the purpose of God. This is the purpose of God for His people. He has called us to be in such a deep, knowing relationship with Him. He hasn't called us. I asked this question before. Well, what was His purpose and design for His church? He hasn't called us to systems. He hasn't called us to simply go through the motions. He's called us to do a deep knowing of Him, to be in a deep relationship with Him where you can hear His voice through, through everything. I believe you can. And so... The purpose of life, the purpose of God sending Jesus to redeem us and our purpose in life is to know this God, to know the Father through the work of the Son by the power of the Spirit. And so life, life there, he says it is life, eternal life is to know Him. So life isn't material things necessarily. <laughs> it's not a better job it's not even how, how you're going. It's not even your emotions. Life itself is found in the knowing of God through Jesus, through the Spirit. That is life. And when you start experiencing this thing, I tell you, it's amazing. I've had moments I'm running through the bush, praising the Lord, the sun shining. <laughs> and I just have this snap moment. I'm like, whoa, this is to know you right now. Life right now, I, I'm experiencing the fullness of life because you're in me, because I'm knowing you right now. And so I challenge you this morning, and I really just felt, where is the band? Can the band come up now? That would be awesome. Thanks, crew. I really, really just felt as I was preparing that 
the Lord is calling us back to this place, back to a deep knowing of Him. And I, I know this is something, don't, don't hear me wrong, this house preaches this well. We keep this at the focus. But even in the midst of all of that, we can get very caught up. It's just like Ben was talking about how he, he, get, he gets caught up in the doing of life, in the busyness of life. And the Lord, I really strongly believe, He's calling us this morning back to the knowing of Him. And I, that may look different for every person. It really may. But I just want to offer this morning the chance that if you're being touched by the Lord right now by what I'm saying, that He is saying something to you. And He's, he's pulling you into this place. And I have a word that I need to release over you Thank you, Jesus. Bless you, Lord. I have a word that I need to release over, to you, over, over you this morning. And I feel his presence. Wow, that's awesome. Thank you, Jesus. Whew. Thank you, Jesus. So I really felt if you would be bold with me this morning, and if you would step forward down the front here, if you would come down, if you're in a place where you're stuck in the doing, and I believe your heart is right as well. I, be, I felt that. I believe your heart is towards Him. But if you're stuck in the doing and you're saying, Lord, I don't know how to know you. I don't know how to come into that place. I don't know how to be brought closer to you. I just need help. That's all it takes, friends. That is all it takes is to say, I need you, Lord. So if you'd like to come down the front, please come, if you feel His presence. And if you don't know Him at all, please come. And I would love to pray with you. I'd lo love to pray for you and just release a breakthrough, a word this morning for you. In Jesus' name. Thanks, man. Bless you. I feel this strong on my heart. There's people who need to be down here. You're in a place of being stuck, going through the motions. And this morning, God wants to release you from that. He's going to teach you how. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for your glory, Jesus. Whew. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, you're so awesome for coming down. Thank you so much. If there is anyone else, I feel you need to be down here because I'm going to speak this and it's going to touch you this morning. It's going to break something off. It's going to start a new season in your life, a season of deep knowing, a deep knowing, an intimate knowing of the Lord through the Holy Spirit. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jesus. This is the purpose of God. This is the reason He sent His Son as a baby. <laughs> Amazing. So you could be redeemed, just like Ben was saying. You could be redeemed back to the garden, back to a place where you walked every step with the Lord, where you heard His voice through everything. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. senior team if you'd like to come and just start laying some hands and we have some ministry team also Alex do you want to come up and just start laying some hands that would be awesome so this was the word the Lord spoke to me so clearly the other day so clearly I was driving along on Tuesday preparing for this message Oh, man. And I heard the Father's voice so clearly. And as he spoke, it broke me. It broke something open inside me. And I heard his voice say, Son, what do you see? Just like he said to one of the prophets, was it Jeremiah, I believe. He said, Son, what do you see? And I closed my eyes. I pulled over, obviously. 
I closed my eyes and I said, Lord, I see the ice breaking and I saw an ocean of ice frozen over, so thick, frozen to the bottom of the ocean. And I said, Lord, I see the ice breaking. (laughs) I see the ice breaking. (laughs) And he said again, son, what do you see? I said, I see the ice breaking, dad. I see the ice breaking. And all of a sudden, I saw the fire of God come up from under the ice. And I had an explosion of ice and the ice broke. This amazing prophetic picture. And I said, God, what's that all about? I don't even know. He said, it's the system, son. I'm breaking it off, people, because I want them to know me. I'm drawing them into a deep, intimate place with me. I'm breaking off the, 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 fu- the systems, the way that they've learned how to do things. And I'm drawing them into a personal relationship, the thing I desired all along. And so I release that over you this morning, that the ice is breaking in Jesus' mighty name. The ice is broken in Jesus' name. You will never be the same. You will be changed this morning. Brought in, you'll find your place and it's your place between you and the Lord. It's your personal place. He's gonna teach you this morning. In Jesus' mighty name.